So we're gathered today in a place that values tradition. From freshman orientation all the way through commencement with sports and Greek life and dorm life and all kinds of traditions in between, this is a tradition-bound place. And it's important. It helps connect students across classes and generations with the same kinds of experiences. But I think traditions are also important outside the university. I think they're important because they give us some anchors, some touch points that allow us to find some stability in a world that is otherwise uncertain and changing and postmodern. And so that's why today I want to encourage you to be a traditionist. Now, I'm not saying traditionalist, not somebody who just likes the old ways and is against change, but a traditionist, somebody who is a uh, respecter and a keeper of traditions. So I'm going to share with you some traditions that I've found useful and give you some ideas about how you might develop some traditions of your own. One tradition that I have enjoyed over the years is about this time of year, actually. I go with my dad every year to some level of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. And this started uh, in 1993. I was a college student in Nashville, Tennessee, and I saw a little blurb in the paper that Nashville was going to host some early round games in the tournament. And so I gave my dad a call. He thought it sounded like fun. So we got the tickets. And that first year, we had seats in the fourth row. We've never had seats that good since. But the first year, fourth row seats, and we were right behind one of the benches. And we got to watch a lot of basketball that weekend. And there's one game that really stands out in my memory. It was between the University of Kentucky and the University of Utah. And at that time, Kentucky's head coach was a guy named Rick Pitino who coaches at the other basketball school in Kentucky now. But so Patino was patrolling the sideline right there in front of us. And that year, Kentucky also had a 13th man, last guy on the bench, who was a fan favorite. His name was Todd Svoboda. And so if it was a really lopsided game, he might get into play for the last couple of minutes. And the game we were watching, Kentucky had a big lead over Utah. It was down to the last few minutes. And so we heard a smattering of Svoboda, Svoboda from around the arena. And with about two minutes to go, there was a guy right in front of us, row three, who stood up and shouted right at Patino's back, Hey, coach, put in Svoboda! Kind of echoed through the gymnasium. And without missing a beat, Patino turned around, looked directly at this guy while play was still going on, and said, You cheer, I'll coach. (laughs) He went back to the game, and we did not hear another word out of row three guy the rest of the weekend. But that experience with some others made us think, this might be fun to do another time. And so the next year, we looked for the nearest location, and we got tickets. And before we knew it, we had ourselves a March tradition. And since we started that tradition, we've seen 99 different universities play in the tournament. We've seen 19 significant upsets. We've visited 10 different sites. We've even been to two Final Fours, including last weekend in Atlanta. So for me, this tradition is a part of my march every year. In fact, in some ways, it doesn't even seem like spring is here for me until I've had basketball with my dad in March. And I think when we think about traditions, we usually think of things in our personal lives or our family lives, like the one I've just shared with you. But I think traditions are important in our professional world as well. I've been a professor here at Purdue now for uh, 15 years. And one of the things that I love about being at a university is the structure of semesters. I like getting a fresh start twice a year. I like being able to see a new group of students all the way through to completion in my class at least, and then get to start over. And within that structure, I've developed some traditions of my own as well. And it doesn't matter what I'm teaching or or what students I have, I'm going to do these same traditions each time. One of those is my class profile. So on the first day of class, I ask students to fill out an index card for me. A lot of you have probably done this, where they tell me their hometown, their major, what they want to be doing in five years, a fun fact. And then I go home that night, I read all the cards, and the next day of class, I always start with a class profile. I say, this is who you are. This is what you've told me about yourselves. This is is, uh, how I could describe the whole group that's gathered here in this room. And we have a lot of fun with that, and it kind of, I think it always gets us off to a good start in the class. It's uh, a little bit of humor, we get to know a little bit about each other, 
And, and I enjoy that. So for today, I went back over the last 10 years of one class that I teach. Uh, it's a large critical thinking and writing class. I've had about 3,000 students in there in the last 10 years. And I looked at what they've told me about themselves through this beginning of the semester tradition. And in those 10 years or so students, I've had students from 39 different states, from 35 different countries, and students who have shared with me a lot of interesting things about themselves. For example, I've had a gold medal Olympic diver in class. Some of you know him. I've also had Miss Whitley County Pork Queen, <laughs> as well as the American Beef Cattle Queen, and Eric, one of my students a few years ago, won $12,000 playing Plinko on The Price is Right. So, I've even had the reserve world champion classic saddle seat Morgan Horse equitation rider. No idea, but it sounds really, really impressive. I even had a student one time, his name was Howard, he came to the wrong classroom and he was too embarrassed to get up and leave, so he sat there for the whole first class and then wrote about it on the index card so that I knew <laughs> what his deal was. And I appreciate students like Howard, and that's a tradition that always kicks off my next term. Now, at the end of the term, I have a different tradition, and that is a student dinner. And, and this is a tradition that began when I was first here at Purdue. I had mostly small classes, 15 or 20 students. And so my wife and I would invite uh, all the students over for dinner, and most of them would come, and we'd have a nice evening together. And then I started teaching bigger classes. And we kind of liked our tradition, but we didn't think we could accommodate 150 or 200 students. So what we've done instead is we just invite the top tier of the class over for dinner at the end of the semester. So we have 10 or 12 students. They come over in the last couple of weeks, and we kind of have a routine down. You know, we, have, we cook dinner, we, we eat with them, uh, we ask them what their plans are, they ask me questions about the program, and then I get to learn a lot from them because they are an expert focus group for me. And so I, I ask them, what went well in the class? What do you wish I would do differently? I've made a lot of improvements to the class over the years because of the feedback that I get from students like these. Uh, but it's a, it's a special tradition, and it's hard for me to feel like the semester is done without the student dinner. It's kind of punctuation for my semester. Now, how can you go about developing personal and professional traditions so that you can be a traditionist as well? I've heard people that try to do this very intentionally. They say, uh, I'm going to start a tradition, or maybe this is going to be the first annual whatever it is. Those are often ill-fated attempts. Have you found that? You know, what if the first annual, whatever it is, is a disaster? You don't want to do that again. So instead of kind of forcing the tradition, I suggest that the first step you take is to inspect your lives. I think most of us probably have traditions in the making. What are things that you do on a regular basis that you enjoy, that you look forward to? Maybe it's weekly or monthly or seasonally or annually. Inspect your life to find those sort of starter traditions, and then once you see them, respect them for what they are. They are traditions. They can serve as these milestones in your path that, again, enable you to handle all of the other uncertainty and change that's going on. So inspect your life, respect the traditions you find, and then protect them. Even a great tradition that you look forward to takes maintenance, doesn't it? I think about my student dinners, we always have them at the end of the semester, which is the worst possible time for my schedule, and probably many of yours as well. I've got meetings, I've got final exams coming up, and so we always have to work pretty hard to fit that in. A couple of times I think we've done it final exam week, which is not ideal. But nevertheless, we're going to make sure that we protect that tradition, because as I said, it really is a mark of the end of my semester, the completion of my task at that point. And so, inspect your life for traditions. Respect the ones you find and protect them. And you too, like me, can be a traditionist. Thanks.